meeting of the Oshkosh Common Council. Would the city clerk please take the roll call? Allison Osby. Here. Paul Mary. Here. Grower. Here. Krause. Here. Heck. Herman. Here. Cummings. Here. Present six. Would you all please stand while Councilmember Allison Osby leads us in the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance? As we gather tonight, we are grateful for the good things that have come to this city. May our decisions always be ones that are for the well-being of all whom we govern. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If my two students would come up this way, we have a certificate for you and a thank you. Uh, now, you're Jenna, correct? Are you Jenna? And then if you want to look into that corner so the camera can get you, so family and friends can see you on TV. A um, couple of questions for you, your name, age, where you go to school, and your favorite subject. Now you've had five minutes to think about your favorite subject. Um, my, na my name is Jenna, and I go to Franklin Elementary, and I'm nine. My favorite subject of school is basically where writing, I really like writing because I like to think of ideas for writing projects. You're very creative, thank you. And Greece? The same questions, your name, age, where you go to school, and your favorite subject. My name is Greece. Uh, I'm 11. Uh, my favorite subject is art and I go to school at Smith. Okay, well thank you, and this is for you. Now you can stay and watch the council meeting or go home and do homework. Or go home and watch it snow too. Yeah, <laughs> it's snow. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before we start I'd, the agenda, I'd like to welcome the student students that are here tonight from Pre Professor Simmons, I believe political science class. Uh, you should all have agen an agenda for the meeting. Uh, if not, there's, there are some out front uh, before you came in, and I will be talking to your class uh, Thursday morning at about 9 o'clock, so if you have any questions from the meeting and the agenda, uh, please uh, ask them on Thursday morning. So we're glad to have you here. Or tonight, too. Or tonight, too. Uh, this is our first time for citizen statements to the council. Uh, Pam, is anyone registered <coughs> to speak? No one is registered. Okay, I'll move on to the consent agenda items. These are items of routine administrative nature that are voted on by the council in a single roll call vote. Staff recommends approval of all items. Any member of the public or common council may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda for discussion. Pam? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. So, second. second. Discussion. Council Member Mugerauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Maurer, if you wouldn't mind, I just have a question regarding 1946, the approved fees for the child, children's amusement park, uh, amusement rides, water equipment, specifically the tennis and pickleball courts. If you can give us some background as to where you got to the point where you're asking to start charging for rentals of those those new courts or the sure. re revamped courts yes um, this was actually part of our proposal um, that the parks board um, take a look took a look at back in 2014 um, when we were talking about some of the baseball field and other athletic field rental fees um, and at that time the parks board um, decided not to institute a fee for tennis and, and basketball courts since that time, we reconstructed the tennis courts at Menominee Park and included new pickleball courts, the only ones that are within the um, city park system. And since then, um, we've started to receive more um, inquiries from groups um, and organizations and businesses wondering about renting and reserving those. Um, so we took the discussion back to the Parks Board back in December 
and open it up for their discussion. They asked us to come back in January with the recommendation after we took a look at how other communities were handling it. Um, we did a survey um, and the results of some of the people that responded to the survey were in your packet. Um, so what we did was um, went back to the Parks Board um, in January with a recommendation of $5 per court per hour. And this is to reserve the courts for specific use. Um, if people are coming out there to play tennis or pickleball, obviously um, there's no charge for that. But this is for um, individuals or groups that might want to um, organize a tournament, league play, such things like that. Okay. That's my only question for you. Thank you, sir. Sure. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So, um, Mr. Mayor, also uh, regarding 1946, when I emailed, um, I had a couple of clarifying questions. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask, <clears throat> so if we just clarify it again, it's only for those groups that are asking to reserve that would be charged those fees, right? That's correct. And I think in your email to me, you were saying that um, someone could theoretically um, request those reservations, like an unlimited number, because we don't really spell out that, and that's more in, a, in the administrative side of things. But I would trust that your department would be judicious if a group came and said, you know, we want, you know, every Saturday morning from nine to noon that yeah, and we, there and would be some discretion there. Correct, and we have had some of that discussion as well at, with the Parks Board, um, because we only have four pickleball courts um, really under our jurisdiction and control. Um, we would most likely say that you can only reserve up to two of those so that we have two remaining for just general um, drop-in use. Um, so that, that's how we would handle it. Okay, I see. So then if somebody is using that, that court, for example, um, but then someone came along, the way that gets resolved is they're actually showing their reservation, their printed out reservation, just like the shelters? Correct. When you run to the or reserve a shelter in the park system, we give you a receipt that has rules on the back for um, what you can and can't do with the shelter. And then what they do is they just come to the court or to the shelter with that um, reservation <coughs> permit. What we also do is we're going to have a, it's a small kiosk, and then each week we put in there if the courts are rented, it'll give the name of the individual, which court, and what time. Um, just like we do with our shelter, shelter oh, like reservations. Oh, printed out kiosk? Yes. Oh, okay. Correct. All right. Um, I just want to clarify, too, that uh, we've had a long-standing arrangement with the school district and the, um, the recreation department, and when the Parks Board approved this or recommended approval, um, we, are, we are going to keep that long-term arrangement where we don't charge the school district. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further council uh, questions or discussion, would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mulgrower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Next, we'll move into pending ordinances. The first is Ordinance 19 57, modify parking regulations on South Park, Aven South Park Avenue, Court Street, and North Main Street. If anyone registered to speak to this? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the vote? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. This is Ordinance 19 58, approved parking regulation updates on Otter and Washington Avenue. Pam? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Next is Ordinance 19 59, approve official mapping for widening of North Kohler Street right of way north of Oshkosh Avenue. Plan Commission recommends approval. Did anyone register? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So, so second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Next is Ordinance 719-60. Approve zone change from single family nine district in parens SR-9 and institutional district in parens I close parens to institutional district with planned development overlay in parens I dash PD, close parens at 575 Monroe Street, 581 Monroe Street, and 532 Broad Street. Planned Commission recommends approval. 
Anyone register? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So, so moved. moved. Second. Discussion? Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. Burridge, um, <clears throat> we spoke last week. This is the one with the fencing. Correct. Correct. Um, Correct. Could you just um, explain a little bit about why we would um, go ahead with an additional chain link fencing? I know that we have that along Parkway Avenue. Um, and they wanted to keep a consistent look and Correct. for money savings. Could you just talk a little bit about that and what the options are there? Correct. Some of the decision-making process that we were, that we were able to recommend or get behind the, the proposal uh, for the chain link fence was it goes back to a historic part of its historical perspective. We actually had the Board of Appeals approved that uh, front yard chain link fence a number of years ago. So when they were looking to expand uh, to the south, they were going to put up a new fence and they wanted to be consistent with the existing fencing as far as a look. Uh, so that was one thing. I think the reason, uh, one of the reasons we were able to uh, support it, get behind it, 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 it was we, we were, were putting a requirement on there that there be some type of landscaping between that southern property and I believe uh, the southern fence line. I think that's the condition. We, I think we had put in the put in the conditions that we want so much um, landscaping points along that southern along that southern fence boundary. I got to find the resolution now. Yeah, I think it was like a hundred points or something. Something like that, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a. It, so the intent won't be it won't be the fence just up against the property line. I think there's a setback to the property line, and we're going to and we're going to try and buffer it, mitigate it a little bit um, with some landscaping. So it's really exciting that they're um, adding on some more play space and a, a garden. Um, the concern was um, from, uh, I guess, a couple of the neighbors about the extent of chain link and, and I guess some of the aesthetic as well as some of the safety. And I didn't know this. Are we, do we comply with the ASTM? And this might actually be a Mr. Maurer question um, <coughs> about whether or not the holes in the chain link are small enough so it can't be climbed? Yes. ASTM and CPSI are um, regulatory agencies for playground equipment. So does that apply to the Boys and Girls Club since it's uh, quasi-private? It is private. <laughs> I do not know that answer. OK. All right. I think there were some safety concerns on ASTM about, you know, the certain projections and the holes being small enough so that kids couldn't climb it. I don't recall saying that. I don't. Was that an email that came out to us? Because I don't remember. No, I that. just happened okay. to look it up. Someone brought up the ASTM, and I mean, I wasn't it's familiar the, with it. The fence that they're proposing is your standard chain link fence, and you see them virtually all, you know, in a lot of places. I see them surrounding a lot of schoolyards nowadays. Uh, so I think from that. Not aware of the standard that you're talking about. I think we had this discussion. If we had it, may potentially do all over again. We might look at a different type of fencing, but there's so much chain link out there right now that until maybe they go, they go to replace it at some point down the line, and then maybe we can look at you know working with them on some other type of fence like a wrought iron, <coughs> something like uh, it's in front of Lincoln School right now, something like that. Well, maybe it's an opportunity for some of the neighborhoods to get creative and work with them on some of the garden things. Thanks. I just want to make sure that everyone understood this is property adjacent to the Boys and Girls Club. <clears throat> okay, if there are no further uh, questions, uh, would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerauer? Aye. Frosey? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Ordinance 19-61, amend Division 6, Residential Rental Contract Registration and Inspection Program of Chapter 16, <coughs> Housing Code, in parens, Rental Housing Advisory Board recommends approval. Did anyone register to speak to this? No one is registered. I'll bring it back to the Council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Councilmember Herman. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Birch. Under the Section 16-49, uh, Residential Rental Inspection, I'm looking at number C. 
Inspection shall be conducted in an occupied dwelling unit with consent from an adult tenant. That's all it says. We apparently took out that the adult tenant has to be present at the time. I think that kind of leaves it open. What the uh, inspection department can call the tenant and say we're coming over. Tenant says I'm not going to be there, but go ahead and go to my apartment. Why would we take out that the tenant has to be present at the time of the inspection? That one I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't part of I think, actually I think updating. They, they, Good. Uh, I believe that was taken out because uh, as a practical matter what happens is the tenant says you can go in but I can't be there but my friend or someone other adult is going to be there uh, the reality is the city would never go into uh, a rental without some authorized person being there it just may not happen to be the tenant who is otherwise given permission. Well, I guess my concern is, is, is this goes back to our uh, special event ordinance that it's too vague. I, I, it's, it leads for interpretation, in my opinion. I, I, I just think it, just, it should have some verbiage that says in an occupied dwelling unit with the consent from an adult tenant present or designated person or something. Otherwise, it just really, to me, opens up I mean, obviously, our staff would not go in there. I, I, I get that. But again, this is an ordinance, and if somebody contests it or makes an issue out of it, um, it's an open-ended. To me, it's an open-ended statement, and I don't. I think it needs to have one more word or something added to it. It's just my interpretation, but I might be looking at it wrong. So maybe one of the additional words could be added with uh, with the tenant with the adult tenant or designee present at the time of expect inspection something I, I just think it's too vague um, to, to 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 leave it open and it like that I just think it needs something else I I agree with everything else uh, above it a is fine I have no issue with uh, the reason the findings uh, just that one sentence for whatever reason maybe that's my Law enforcement background <laughs> looks at it as an open-ended situation. I just, I just have a problem with that. That one sentence. Our office would have a problem with them going in without anyone being there too. So, right. Um, and so, and so, I, I think we should show the intent. The intent okay. is that there will be someone present, whether it's the tenant or the tenant designee. It could be his parents, as far as. In you know. paragraph two, it addresses when it's in a when it's in a vacant dwelling unit. So that would give you the coverage. Because there it talks about who was present at the time of but the inspection. But is vacant meaning an empty apartment, or is it vacant because the tenant's not there? No, it's a vacant dwelling unit. No, I, what I'm actually, what I'm suggesting is that there may be value that you're suggesting to put that in paragraph oh. one, because that's a separate instance from paragraph two. And we're already addressing in paragraph two that somebody's present at the time of the inspection. So there may be some value to putting in and an adult, you know, and with an adult tenant or designee present at the time of inspection. And it, it, I just think that, that that takes the burden off of our inspectors so that they, you know, obviously we, I'm sure, Aaron and Alan and, him would, and Mr. Zarati would say you can't go unless there's a tenant there or the landlord or somebody, but I just think we want to have that so that there's just no confusion on, on the ordinance. Councilmember Allison Osby. Um, pre yeah, pr pretty much. It was the same thing. I had reached out to Miss Lawrence, and she, of course, is out of the area, and Dave and I were not able to connect until right before. But essentially, it was just looking at the wording and thinking we needed to button it up a little bit, um, just so that it's clear and it can't be misinterpreted in any manner. So I think just maybe a little bit more defined wording, just so it's not that perception. If somebody just reads it like that, because that was my question as well. Right, the suggested language won't change. It is perfectly consistent with what the intent of staff was. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll just add my two cents worth that there should be someone present when there's an inspection made, either the, the tenant or parent, you know, all you kids and parents and so forth. 
it doesn't happen in the world of real estate. We have a home inspection. There should be someone present, uh, both the realtor and the potential buyer. So, Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thanks, Mayor. So, um, as the council liaison for the Rental Housing Advisory uh, Board, I, I can say that with all emphasis, um, the inspections department has very clearly stated they will not enter if there is not someone present and without permission. However, I would agree with fellow council members. Perhaps that could be a little clear. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mayor. <coughs> I'd be happy to offer okay. up language, but I can't make a motion. <laughs> so, no, well, hey, that's, Herman. Don't die on us now. Um, so to go what you're saying, I'd like to make an amendment to C1 in an occupied dwelling unit with consent from adult tenant present or designated. Or designee? Whatever you said, Mark. Whatever that word was, designated. Or a designee of the tenant. De yeah, there you go. Designee of a tenant. Present at the time of inspection. Uh, it has to be an adult. It can't be a juvenile kid. It can't be, you know, cousin Larry from California that just happens to be hanging out in the apartment that day and, you know. <laughs> Although, if it could uh, be. cousin Larry's could an be. adult, then uh, he would fit that. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I think we can exclude Larry's. Yeah, that's true. In an occupied dwelling unit with the consent from adult tenant or designee, adult designee. Yeah. How's Pre that sound? Present at the time of the inspection. Present at the time. Do you, uh, yeah, I would like to have that present at the time of inspection. Yeah. Just so that's yeah. clarified. I don't, uh, I don't know how many of the students out there are tenants, but I would think you agree with that. That would make sense, right? <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of heads nodding, so. I'll second that. All right, second. Um, discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second to include the, the, the new wording. Um, would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugrower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. I will vote on 19, ordinance 19-61 19 with the amendment. Uh, approve zone change from single family. Oops, I'm sorry. That's right. Men division, division six, residential rental contract registration and inspection program of chapter 16, housing code. Residential Re housing advisory board recommends approval. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. It's already on the floor, isn't it? No, it's on the floor. No. We, yeah. Six. The discussion? We're still on it. Yeah, that, that motion's still on the floor. Now you have the amended motion. Okay. On the floor. So you, you're you're okay on motions. Yes. Okay. Okay. Councilmember Mugerauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, um, <clears throat> I want to thank the Rental Housing Advisory Board. Um, they worked uh, very hard for for a while to get this right. Staff put in a lot of time to get the get the data and get some uh, analysis done for us. Um, as part of this, you're going to see that there are four districts uh, identified uh, for inspection. And generally, those were, were uh, determined by some, some data from different sources um, within the city, um, crime data and um, nuisance ordinance violations and things like that. And uh, so I feel, I feel pretty confident in those, those areas that should be inspected and need some improvement um, should, be, uh, sh should fall within those, those districts that were identified. With that said, um, this program still will not, in my opinion, do enough to improve the health, safety, and wellness of, of the rental community here in the city of Oshkosh. Um, this will be a very uh, minimally uh, effective program. Uh, previously, we had about a 5 to 6 percent effective rate. Basically, we only uh, gained entry into about 5 to 6 percent of the homes we sent notices out to. And if that um, trend continues, um, only gaining uh, access to five to six percent of the um, several thousand isn't very effective use of twenty-five thousand dollars that we budgeted for this, and, and we don't know how much this is going to cost. And um, so, I, it's just still will not be effective. Um, I know several council members are going to feel that a inspection program in general is a good thing, um, but it's just not enough. If we want to really improve the 
health, safety, and wellness of the rental uh, community and our community in general, then we should actually be inspecting all homes within those uh, areas, not just rental properties. Um, but I don't think the community is going to be in favor of that, nor would we have the budget for that. Um, but it doesn't mean that that's not the right thing to do if you really want to improve um, health, safety, and wellness of the entire community, not just the rental community. As a clarifier, just so people know, this will not include any exterior inspections. The reason for that would be um, the board felt that uh, under state code, with what the state uh, legislators uh, gave to us, um, if they passed, if a rental property passed a exterior inspection, they would no longer be within the program and they would have passed it and wouldn't have been able to be inspected for five years. Um, so the board felt that uh, by passing an exterior only inspection, um, they shouldn't be uh, exempted. So that instead of uh, inspecting exterior and uh, interior, um, it's only going to be just, if you get access to the interior, we'll do a full inspection and um, we won't do a drive-by or a walk-by like we were currently doing. So we will not be um, touching those, those houses next door that have visible, um, visible violations or visible um, uh, repairs needed. I guess those are the highlights I wanted to touch on. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I want to remind Mr. Mugrauer that the reason the, the initial attempt did not achieve the uh, success rate we hoped for was many landlords sent intimidating and threatening letters to their tenants, uh, telling them that they would be responsible for the inspection, they'd be responsible for repair, repairs, and almost uh, th telling them that they would be terminating their lease. So I think there was a tremendous amount of opposition from the rental community initially um, and I think uh, it's morally wrong to threaten your tenants with the type of letters that were sent to these people young and old alike initially to stop the program Deputy Mayor Palmieri Thank You Mayor I just wanted to uh, point out and make the distinction that those exterior inspections would not be done as part of this rental inspection program However, that does not exempt or um, preclude the exterior inspection when there is a complaint based or a complaint lodged. Um, the, there's, there's two different types of inspections that our city handles. So I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, if there are complaints made, um, those inspections would go on as I understand it. Council Member Allison Osby. Thank you. Um, just based on the, the comments made by um, Mr. Mugerauer and Deputy Mayor Palmieri and, and Mayor Steve Cummings, I'm thinking if there's something in particular regarding to the overall ordinance for um, the rental units, we should probably put that on an agenda for down the road and just speak directly to the amendment that's actually here, um, just to make sure that we're not conflicting or confusing the public. That's just my opinion, um, but I mean, I'm not upset or anything, Matt. Don't don't take it that way. I just was thinking that I wasn't sure that. <clears throat> I think if the, if there's something that maybe specifically in regards to looking at the overall program, and if you think that there are things that we can do to make it better for the community, then maybe we should put that on the agenda down the road. But point of clarification, if I may, that's what's on the agenda right now. We're approving the new inspection program. We haven't approved it before. But it sounds like you're looking for something beyond what's actually in here as well, or maybe I misinterpreted what you said. A different inspection program or a better inspection program than what is being put forth That's on the I'm table. That's what I'm saying. Okay. If there's no further discussion, would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? No. Crozy? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried 5-1. Deb, would you please, it's not working again, so just disconnect yourself. Thank you. Um, uh, Ordinance 19-62 amends section 30-74, table of land uses and 30-78, commercial land uses of chapter 30 is zoning ordinance to establish short-term rentals in parents, Planned Commission recommends approval. City Clerk? Uh, no one is registered. 
Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Discussion, Council Member Herman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Burrich, I guess. Um, can you kind of give it a little history of where we, where this came from and where we're going? And my biggest concern is, 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 is this going to have an impact to the majority of our homeowners that rent their home during EAA? Uh, I guess I, I, I just think that I don't want to muddy the water for our citizens, and yet I understand the VBRO people, I understand the B&B &B people, the bed and breakfast people, pay room tax and all those other things. And I know the playing field needs to be leveled and the state's allowed us to do that, but just can you kind of give us an overview of why we need this ordinance and what the intent of this ordinance is to do? Sure, and, and right now, on this particular item, remember we're talking about the zoning. I know. That's what, in the zoning right now, right now we have what's, what's, what's termed vacation rentals in our zoning ordinance, and that's for 14, 14 days or less. And that's only in, it's only, right now it's currently only allowed in one, two, three, four, five, five uh, zoning districts. With what happened with the state, uh, the state law, uh, the right to rent law uh, passed, uh, what happened was uh, they pretty much they, 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 they exempted local zoning control on what's termed short-term rentals. So if you have a house and you want to rent it out on a short-term basis, uh, you're allowed to do that. So this action that we're requesting right now is we're just saying that short-term rentals, anything less than 29 days, can if you have a rental unit, uh, it's now permissible in every zoning district. So it's no longer okay. limiting. Uh, you're not limited in any zoning district. Any zoning district where you have a residential dwelling unit, you can have a short-term rental. And the reason why we're doing that is to be consistent with that state law change. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, Mr. Birch, I guess just for folks out there, too, I know there was some <clears throat> confusion about this just in regard to the 10 days. Hmm. And um, this was not targeting any particular event. It was just saying that anything 10 days mm -hmm. and in addition to 10 days, anything under 10 days does not fall Correct. into this. Correct, uh, the, the dad cap, well, first of all, that the dad cap uh, tourist rooming house license kicks in at 10 days, and that's kind of why we why we picked the 10 days. I think some communities, you can make an argument that it should be a day one, that you should be renting out a safe house, and you should have to go through some of these inspections. Ours, however, is is sitting at that 10 days to be consistent, again, with, 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 the, state, uh, with the state requirements. Just for folks out there watching, tell them what dad cap is. Oh, God. It's, uh, Department of Agriculture, Trade, Trade. Consumer Protection. Uh, correct. Thanks. I see no other council members wishing to speak. Would you please please take the roll? Allison Osby. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Mugrower. Aye. Crosey. Aye. Herman. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Carried six. This is Ordinance 19-63. Create section 8-1.2 short-term rentals <clears throat> of the municipal code. Is anyone registered? No one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Let's not all jump in at once. <laughs> Discussion? No one appears to want to speak to... Uh, I think since Mr. Birch is, is present, maybe he can speak to it. Okay. Uh, this is where kind of where we start to implement the short-term rental requirements. So this is where uh, we start to get into the, you have to have an application, you have to have the inspection, you have to have Winnebago County actually come out and do the inspection. So this is kind of where the rubber hits the road is where we, where we require the actual licensing of the structure, that's where the that's where the the, the particular design standards come into play. Uh, you can't have you know things like grills and things like that. Um, you have to have so much floor space, and those those requirements that you're seeing coming into this ordinance are coming down from the state. We're, we we picked a lot of that stuff up from the, from some of the state rooming house requirements, and they're just and they're just in the ordinance. 
So really what that is, is the, the, the license itself is how, we, is how we're implementing the short term rental. I can try and answer specifics on it. But as, it's, yeah, as opposed to the zoning, this is the, the regulatory side of the licensing and, and things like that. That's probably the best way Correct. to describe it. Correct. Council Member Herman. I guess I'm just looking at the letter we unfortunately didn't receive until tonight, but obviously it appears EAA is not real happy with this, and that I, I believe that probably 90% of our people that rent their homes out rent during EAA. I know there are some that rent EAA, some rent uh, Country USA, some probably rent uh, Rock USA and Life Fest too, and maybe run a B and B or B B V R O out of their house without reporting it. But I guess um, I know we're following state statute, and I understand all that. Um, I'm just wondering because of the uniqueness of EAA and that that we shouldn't look at going from 10 days to 16 days, because I do believe that a lot of vendors come more. You know, they have to come earlier and stay longer, and I think a lot of those vendors stay at private residential properties throughout the city. And I, I just would hate to have this affect EAA, what EAA has all done for the community of Oshkosh and, and putting us on the map and things like that. I just think that we need to work with that important partner on, on this. Um, I know the CVB has not really weighed in on it one way or the other. They're, they're willing to work with, um, you know, the city on it. Um, but I just think that 10, 10 days, uh, the convention runs seven. I think we got to give a little room here on, on it. Um, I guess I would like, if there's support from other council members to bump it up to 16 nights before everything kicks, but I guess some of that kicks in no matter what, right? At 10 days? 10 days. So. 10, days the, 10 days the state tourist rooming house license requirement comes into play. And that state rooming house requirements has most of the requirements uh, for getting that license. So the inspection from the health department, those all come in through that, through that requirement. Our, you know, what we're envisioning is, you know, some, some paperwork and application showing, okay, this is your house, this is how many rooms you have, this is what you're renting out, that way we can at least know what's going on. And then you have a, de uh, in, in, in some cases, you'll have a registered agent that might not be yourself if we have a problem with some, with any of these places. Okay. This would be for Mr. Traska then. Um, Traska, if we, we can't, our local ordinance can't supersede state statute, correct? Correct. So state statute says 10 days, we really can't supersede that, correct? Well, we could. We uh, so just to be clear about what we're talking about, we're, uh, the zoning or the uh, city's regulatory aspect of this does not have to be 10 days. If it was nine days or if it was 11 days, it would not violate the state uh, tourist rooming house license because that's it's a different thing. Okay. I think the practical side of it is that it's if we say 16 days, we say something uh, that's different from state law. We're pretty sure there would be confusion that people would think that oh, the city said that it's 16 days, therefore the state rule is 16. The state rules will always be 10 days unless the state changes that. And actually, I talked to Mr. Gelser. I said, well, maybe there'd be some value to getting that change at the state level. But in the meantime, we still have the, the hand word dealt. So I, I think Mr. Gelser understands that. But I think he's representing the, the vendors. Because for the, I think the, the attendees, the, uh, the audience at EAA, this, the 10 days would be sufficient. And I think that was staff's thinking. Mm -hmm. The vendors, from everything I've heard, uh, there was a gentleman who came spoke a couple weeks ago to the council, made the similar request. I think it's legitimate that the vendors do stay more than 10 days. I, I won't deny that. I think that that's real. The question is, is that's a narrow group of people. Do we want to give them that, uh, that, extend that courtesy that they wouldn't, those people wouldn't have to give those licenses if that's the only rental they did in the whole year? And that's really the question before the council. Council Member Mugerauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
And I just want to clarify, so if I'm wrong, please tell me I'm wrong. So as it's proposed right now, short-term rental license would kick in at 11 days. Anything more than 10, you need to have a short-term rental license. However, on day one, you have to remit room tax, no matter what. And that's what we're really talking about to the folks from EAA and everybody else who rents is the 10% room tax that they're going to be get, getting hit with. That starts on day one, no matter if you have a right. short-term rental license or not, or a b, &B uh, from the state or the seller's permit for sales tax. Room tax starts on day one. And the room tax is item 34. We're really slicing this thin tonight. But they're all linked because yeah. they're all in together. All the information's here together, and that's why I bring it up. But that no matter the 10 or the 16 or the 14, their real complaint is the room tax right. when it really boils down to it. And that starts on day one if we enact the room tax on, if we correct the room tax uh, that we have on the books already. Mr. Gelser's letter, I believe, was limited to just item 33 because he knew that I was putting on the agenda to staff recommend to lay over that issue. I think you're correct that they do have that concern, but I think he, I think he took it uh, that I was giving him as an act of good faith that I'd be recommending we lay it over because there's a couple options on what we can do if we want to change that. But that day one requirement for the room tax exists right now if council takes no action on item 34. So if we're going to revisit that issue, I want to take a little more time. The city attorney gave you a, a very good memo on options that are available to you. And I think you probably want to absorb that and, and think about which option you think might be work best. No one's perfect. No one of those options are perfect. And I think it's worthwhile kicking around. Mr. Gelser, I think, took me on my word that, that I was going to recommend that, and I am. But 30, so that's why he limited his, the scope of his letter to 33. If I hadn't made that show of good faith with him, he would have given you a separate letter on 34, I'm almost certain. Well, I'm just wondering, is it appropriate to lay this one over in addition to the next one as they are somewhat linked? Or what, what my fellow council members think as to, as to that? Um, Councilmember Allison Osby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, with, in regards to what uh, Mr. Mugerauer is saying, I guess I have that same question as well. You know, unless basically what you're saying is that 19-63 is, I mean, essentially we're handcuffed by the state to have to create and pass something in order to move on. That's, I mean, I'm, is that essentially what you're saying well, our old and I, I'm going to think I'm going to defer to the, uh, Mr. Proska for this because uh, the the new rules that the state adopted said short-term rentals or anything less than 29 days or uh, Darren anything more than more than six less than 29 okay so or more than seven one of those two so our issue is when are we going to uh, put in ours we believe that it's absolutely appropriate that we have this regulation. Uh, Mr. Bird shared with me an article about uh, just the number of Airbnbs uh, that were surveyed that don't meet certain safety standards. So we want to have something. Uh, so really, it's a question of when do we want to kick it in? So I mean, I mean, I get that because obviously we have a, a rental inspection program for actual rental properties. But you know, that that's kind of my question is, you know, if we have, is is there a difference between somebody who owns and operates and has an LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp, you know, with their rental properties as compared to somebody who's owner occupied, who essentially is, I mean, the mortgage is in their name, they're living in the household 350 days out of the year, but then rent it out for a little bit. I mean, is, is the state really saying, and is that what we're really saying is that's who we want to go after is those that it's not really a business. Um, at the end of the day, they're supposed to declare the income, but you know, is that our our role to police that? So I mean, that's that's where I'm kind of questioning because that was some of the questions I had, you know, last week, and you know, um, it's a lot to digest. So that's why I want to see, like, if you're saying we, in order to move forward, we have to pass this, or do we? Can this be laid over, as Mr. Mugerauer said, so that we can all kind of chew on this a bit and think it through before and actually understand what the state is saying, what is our right as a municipality, and then how to execute from there. Because I'll be honest, I, it's as clear as mud for me. 
Councilmember Herman. And I guess that I agree with Councilmember Allison Osby because, you know, not even the people that vacate their home. What about the people that stay in their home and rent a bedroom out? It's different. That's a different set of circumstances because when so, we're residing in the house yet, that is different. Okay, than well, there's people. nothing that it really explains that. It, it, it kind of talks about, you know, <clears throat> doesn't the, does it mention? I, I, I read it, and I'm, I'm not sure if I missed it. Does it say that it has to be not owner occupied, like in a rental situation? So, it, so, it, so if if um, John Jones down the street wants to rent out a bedroom for EA, he can do that, and he doesn't have to have, and he can rent it out for a hundred bucks a night, and he can do that and not have to pay anything. Owner occupied are in a different. If when you're re maintaining your owner occupied status, when you're actually residing in the in the, mm -hmm. in the dwelling, that's a different that's a different standard. So that doesn't fall under this ordinance at all. And typically, the short term rentals aren't doing that. You're running it. It's no different than. And you're not in the house in short term rentals, right? Okay. I just want to it, clarify it, that because I think there's a lot of people that do it both ways. Correct. And, and I think the the real dilemma we have is you've got the new developments with the Airbnbs of the world and that a new that new economy versus we were doing Airbnb before Airbnb Airbnb existed. Was wrong, yeah. And now because we're because we're very unique and we can't reconcile that with state law. We have to follow what the state law says. So when are we going to when are we going to require this to kick in? Um, and I, we have to decide on we just have to pick a number of days that we want to do it at. Um, we're certain that there will be confusion if we have a 16 day or something other than 10 because it'll just confuse people on the operational side and I can predict that somebody will call us and ask us about our rule and we'll say our rule says 16 days and they will make the incorrect assumption that that also applies to the state law that's the practical side of it and I you know the council understands that it that's really the the challenge that we have and I think that's why staff chose the 10 days because they felt it would uh, from a regular not from a regulatory standpoint but just from a practical standpoint people would understand 10 is 10 across the board um, but we don't have as Mr. Gelser says we are not required to do 10 days we, we recommended 10 days because we thought it would be practical in the long run there's one other consideration too we're talking the city of Oshkosh but many people in the surrounding townships are renting out their homes and I can guarantee people that come here from California or New York or Indiana don't really know if the homes in the town of Black Wolf, the city of Oshkosh, or Algoma. Yeah. So do we know what the townships will be doing with that so as to not further confuse a visitor? I suspect, and this is just a guess, that they're not going to do it at all except in some of the more um, uh, some of the community some of the communities that have uh, staff that can enforce those but I would say the ones that you cited probably won't regulate it at all so will that further confuse a visitor that that will always be because I'm sure everybody's saying they're going to Oshkosh <coughs> for the flying you're absolutely right um, that that's going to exist that exists today Councilmember Allison Osby. So I guess that would be my question as well. Then, from an economic development standpoint, you know, if if we're implementing but surrounding areas are not, are we pushing essentially that business out of Oshkosh into the surrounding communities? I would say no, because the demand is so high for this housing that <clears throat> it's really going to be the person who not is renting the facility. Uh, or not or not the um, the hotel uh, occupant but the person renting out their house they're gonna have the responsibility and that'll income that'll be incumbent upon us to to get the word out work very closely with the CVB I've talked with Ms. Albright she recognizes that they're gonna have to do a lot of work to to get the word out on that and it will take some time but from a safety standpoint because of the things that that we need to look at um, if you saw this article, and I'd be happy to share it with you. You know, there's uh, statistics on, and this is about Airbnb, uh, the number that don't have smoke detectors or CO detectors. What was, what were the other ones in the article, Darren? I, I, I got it here, right? Um, 
prevalence of fire extinguishers, prevalence of first aid kits. And uh, smoke alarms, 80% nationwide. Uh, fire extinguishers, average nationwide, 42%. So we would, those types of things we would, we would expect that people would have through our process. The gist of that article is that I think they came up with fire, uh, from the fire side of things. It wasn't looking at some of the other safety issues that might be out there as well. Councilman Recrosi. Um, I just had a question. I don't know if it would be possible, but I think the last thing we want to do as a council is put a bad taste in people's mouths about EEA, which along with probably Oshkosh Corp has put us on the map, like one of us has said. Um, would there be a possibility to have like a blackout date for some of these proposals of like three days before the calendar year and three days after during the EEA year so we don't have to enforce these things? Because I've talked to plenty of people that rent out their homes. It's return customers year after year that they're having the same families come. And I mean, the people are knowledgeable people. They aren't being taken advantage of. It's not the shady deal that might happen in July, coming to rent out a home for a month for some family reunion type thing. So I mean, these homes are usually top-notch homes that people expect to be rented out. I don't know the answer to that question. That's a great question. Uh, I think there are a lot of eyes that lit up with that. I don't have the answer for you. Um, if it, that if council wants to lay it over for us to investigate that, you know, certainly we can do that. Because uh, I mean, any think, or any of these issues, yeah. I think there's that one's that one's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Dave, I don't even know if you if you're prepared to answer a question like that about blackout dates. Well, you just have to be careful about being arbitrary. Like, well, we you're, can you're, choose. You're, you're choosing mm -hmm. who you like and well, who we're you allowed don't to like. do that. Pardon, yeah, aren't we? We're allowed to do that, aren't we? I mean, we can pick and choose which right. events are treated which way. You could be arbitrary and capricious, too. I'm not, and I'm not arguing. I just need to keep in mind uh, the reason you're uh, selecting certain groups over others. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued enough by the comment that, you know, we should be getting this adopted as soon as possible. I'm just being honest with you. But it's, it's end of January. We've been doing without it for 22 days. <laughs> 14 days, or I guess 21, it's going to be 21 days more before we next meet, probably isn't the end of the world. And if that's if that's what council wants us to do, to do a little more research, kick some of these ideas around. I'd appreciate any other suggestions like that, because so we can you know make sure we investigate any of the other issues. Um, uh, I don't know if we can do that. As, as Mr. Prosca said, we have to look at those things and make sure we, we wouldn't be perceived. I mean, anybody can argue, uh, anybody can argue anything, but if you'd like us to look at that, we can certainly take a look at it. Councilmember Allison Osby. Thank you, Mayor. Based on our, the conversation that we've had amongst council um, and along with the comments from Mr. Roloff, I'd like to make a motion to lay over Ordinance 1963 until two weeks from tonight or the next meeting, first meeting in February. February 12th. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Would you please take a roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerauer? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Next is Ordinance 19 64, which is a men room tax ordinance. The staff recommends laying over. I would look for a motion and a second. Councilmember Herman? Mayor, I make a motion that we. Lay over uh, ordinance 19 64 men room tax ordinance until the next council meeting. Second. The next meeting would be February 12th. 12th. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Crosey? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. Next is ordinance, ordinance 19 65. Authorize the director of finance to issue citations. Is anyone registered to speak to this? Ordinance? No, no one is registered. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Would you please take the roll? Ellison Osby. Aye. Paul Mary. Aye. Mugerower. Aye. Crosey. Aye. Herman. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Carried six. Next is Ordinance 19-66, amend Chapter 30. Zoning ordinance to create flood storage district within section 30-156 of the floodplain overlay district. Plan commission recommends approval. 
Did anyone register to speak to this one? No one is registered. Bring it back to council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Would you please take the roll? Ellison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Hoogerower? Aye. Crozy? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. We now have two new ordinances. There will be no action taken on either one this evening. The first is Ordinance 19-67, approved zone change from Suburban Mixed Use District in Prince SMU, close Prince to Suburban Mixed Use District with Plan Development Overlay in Prince SMU, Dash PD close friends at 2020 South Kaylor Street. Plan Commission recommends approval. No one wants to speak to this. Next is Ordinance 19 68, approve amendments to Chapter 19 Parks and Recreation of the City of Oshkosh Municipal Code. All right. We now have, we have two new resolutions. The first is Resolution 19 69. Approve specific specific implementation plan for an increased playground and kindergarten at 575 Monroe Street, 581 Monroe Street, and 532 Broad Street. Boys Club of Oshkosh. Plan Commission recommends approval. Anyone sign up? No one has signed up. Bring it back to the council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion. Would you please take the roll? Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Crozy? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. The final is Resolution 19-70, Approved City Manager 2019 Goals. Did anyone register? No one registered. Bring it back to the Council for a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Discussion? Deputy Mayor Palmieri? Thank you, Mayor. Um, if I could just uh, share a couple of comments and then uh, read off the city manager's goals. Uh, so this is the second part of the city manager's evaluation process that um, we've now completed. And the council does find that the city manager, manager continues to work in the best interests of the city of Oshkosh and its, its citizens, remaining focused on details and the strategic plan for the city. This year follows on the heels of the genesis of significant projects such as the Transload Facility, Menominee Arena, and Oshkosh Corporation projects with numerous amendments, Oshkosh Avenue development and other significant development opportunities that heretofore were unanticipated. Moving these projects forward while maintaining basic services and continued implementation of strategic priorities, the city manager diligently continues to serve the council and the city with a high level of professional administration. The city manager, along with staff leadership, have made notable improvements, such as the commentary from leaders across the state are asking for our guidance on similar issues of concern. Council recognizes there um, is continued need for us to keep our lines of communication open with the city manager and continued improvement. A few notable ac accomplishments include the recently passed professionally prepared budget, a release of the new city website, significant street sewer stormwater infrastructure improvements along with exceptional customer service coming from multiple departments and an award-winning GIS project. The council's confidence in the city manager's abilities along with a recent market survey of peer community administration has led council to approve a pay raise for the city manager in 2019, increasing the salary to the amount of $154,000. The council will continue to work on specific goals with the city manager and finalize them in January. That's obviously a little bit dated because we are approving those goals tonight. So number one, there are four goals. Update the debt management plan, recommend to council a new long-term general obligation debt goal with a progress report to council by July 1 and a formal plan for council consideration prior to submitting the 2020 CIP and budget, approximately October 1st. Number two, evaluate the city's emergency preparedness plan and conduct training for all department heads and other appropriate personnel as it relates to the activation of the Emergency Operations Center by September 30, 2019. Number three, develop a policy for acquiring real estate, including blighted properties, and develop a policy by which the city and RDA owned properties may eventually be conveyed back to private ownership for development, redevelopment, and or affordable infill housing by June 1, 2019. And lastly, number four, 
sustain ongoing collaboration with the unity and community organizers in their annual celebration involving city departments as needed to ensure a successful event continue to collaborate with the Oshkosh Community Success Coalition in advancing community-wide goals for diversity and inclusion. That's all. I did want to make one comment on goal number three, and it's the awarding of acquiring real estate. And I talked to Deputy Mayor Palmer before the meeting that uh, that includes a single property or multiple proper properties within a, within a neighborhood. And this is something that the RDA, we've discussed this uh, quite a bit, working with GoH9 and so forth, and other partners. Council Member Mugerauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, thank you to uh, Deputy, Palmer, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Palmieri for organizing the process. Um, it seemed to go very well for my first time through the, through the ringer, through the process. So um, thank you for organizing that. And thank you to City Manager uh, Roloff for working with us. Um, I know coming into this, uh, this term for myself, um, one of the uh, maybe frustrating parts from the last year's goals was you know, not having some deadlines on there um, and being uh, uh, not as specific as we could have been. Um, these goals definitely have some, some deadlines for you, um, self-imposed as well. You were definitely part of the process. Um, but, but deadlines are good things. They spur action, and they make sure that uh, things are being reported back to us in a, in a good and timely fashion for us to, uh, to make good decisions later in the year. So um, that's all I got, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. If there is no further discussion, I would look for a you take the roll. Allison Osby? Aye. Paul Mary? Aye. Mugerower? Aye. Krause? Aye. Herman? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Carried six. <clears throat> Next is council discussion, direction of city manager, and future agenda items. The first is workshops, joint meeting with the Oshkosh Area School Board, January 30 at 5 p.m. at the Oshkosh Area School District office at 215 South Eagle Street. Can everyone make that? As of right now. As of right now. Yes. All right. Good. Our next is a meeting with our legislatures. The proposed date and time is February 25th at 8 a.m. The location to be determined. Councilmember Mugerauer. I apologize. Can we go back? To, is there a rough agenda other than talking about um, transportation for school children? Well, thank you for, for bringing up I that apologize. question. I apologize. I didn't get the button soon enough. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. There were some uh, some other items that the council members brought up from the last meeting. I know poverty was one of them. I believe, um, uh, trying to think of, there was one other one. I, I have it jotted down. I just have it on my last agenda. Um, I did speak with Superintendent uh, Cartwright, and uh, I, she doesn't believe the school board is prepared to discuss the busing issue at this time. They would prefer to wait. Uh, subsequent meeting, uh, they felt they weren't ready to discuss that issue. Um, I did have a, going back to my uh, goal about uh, diversity and inclusion, Superintendent Cartwright and I had an opportunity to drive down to Dubuque, so we had six hours, actually seven with the snowstorm, seven hours in the car. We discussed some ideas that we could certainly um, uh, bring forward, uh, but I don't think they're in a position to talk about it at this time. And, I think we might be able to work on a couple of things that we can bring forward. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so, Mr. Roloff, so they're not ready to talk about the trip to Dubuque? Can oh, no. The, the, on our trip to Dubuque, we brought up the busing okay. issue. And, right. and we talked about agenda items, and poverty was something that was certainly on their agenda, but they weren't ready to talk about busing. Sure. So, um, so would it be appropriate for us to maybe have the discussion about the trip to Dubuque? On I'm that so, joint agenda. Uh, there, yeah, yes, yes. I think we could talk about that. That would be a great idea. I'd be happy to. I'll talk to Dr. And Cartwright about uh, yeah. make sure we get our our notes squared away. But um, yeah, I think that would be would be good. We were stuck in a traffic jam uh, in Madison, and we had plenty of time to talk because we were moving at five to zero miles an hour. <laughs> so we can do that. Thank you for that suggestion. Uh, the next meeting is the rescheduling of the City Hall and Parks Facility Workshop. And I believe the date that's been recommended is January 29. That's one week from today. I 
I was just looking for something quick if that's possible. Otherwise, if I thought the last time some council members had some possible conflicts on that date, and uh, I think they're, they're both very important topics. So if you can't, I'd like to make sure we had no more than, you know, like one council member missing. We, but that's up to you. Uh, you're going to have a one-hour meeting with the school board the day after. Um, it's really about your what time are you looking at on the 29th? It would it would be the same two-hour uh, commitment that we looked for last time. 5.30 for the first one, 6.30 for the next one. Each of them one hour, hard stop at 7.30. I could do that. Works Everybody's checking their well. phone. Everybody's checking their phone. Yeah. That I thought I remember Lori saying she couldn't make it. I don't know about Ms. I don't know about uh, Tom, uh, Councilmember Peck. Yeah, I think I remember Deputy Mayor Palmieri saying she couldn't make it. Councilmember Allison Osby, you were a little on the fence too on that. I yeah, because that takes two days out of traveling that week. Um, um, I, I would say schedule it and just let me try to work some magic. Okay. We'll let you later than the 29th. Would that would that help your schedule? What's that? Later than the 29th of this month. Would that help your schedule? No, it's just having two two nights back to back on a off council oh, week. Okay, okay. So I'll I'll work some magic. We'll contact Bolton FGM uh, about doing that. Thank you very much. Oh, and the, the meeting with the legislators, just uh, we jumped over that. February 25th, that's a Monday. I think the direction from council was Mondays and Fridays seem to be the best day for the legislators. Uh, I know that Representative Shra will be unavailable for that, but both uh, Senator Fion and Representative Hintz were both available. And we try to tie that in with a location where we could perhaps do a tour of a city facility for, for those representatives as well. So if it's two out of the three, is that satisfactory to council? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. February 25th, Work. we'll have it at 8 o'clock, and uh, we'll let you know the location. Um, but it'll involve some type of small tour. In the past, we've done the library. Then we did the uh, field museum. operations facility. Yep. Or the museum, museum, not the library. Yep. We did both. We, yeah, we, we did have the library. We did, okay. That was when we had the evening. Yep. Oh, okay. So we'll find a suitable location. Thank you very much. Next is a recommendation from Long Range Finance Committee regarding funding option to replace street and sidewalk special assessments. Council Member Mugerauer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know, City Manager Roloff, do you want to start on this or do you want me to? Uh, Council Member Peck, who's the chair of that committee, is on. Unable to be here tonight. Um, I don't know how you want yeah, to proceed I, with I, informing us. Yeah, with uh, with uh, Councilmember Peck absent. I, I guess I'll start it, and, and if you can just help uh, provide some more con context. Uh, the committee's direction from council was to take a look at the special assessment policy relative to this, and take a look at options for changes to the special assessment policy. Um, I think there was a consensus on the. Uh, the committee that some amendments were appropriate. The question was, what's the appropriate funding source? So they went back and forth, and uh, and there was also the discussion about the the option that Nina has enacted uh, that is different from a vehicle registration fee slash wheel tax. And I think the committee uh, felt that that approach, which is based on impervious surface with a cap, um, would apply more equitably across all different land uses, both uh, business, nonprofit, non-tax, uh, non-taxable property, um, as well as businesses, um, and that it would raise sufficient funds it, because with a vehicle registration fee, it was per vehicle. So say a, a, a home with um, two vehicles and had uh, a $25 fee, they'd be paying actually $50 whereas a flat rate per household might be more equitable. Um, and the funds that would be generated would be sufficient enough not only to cover 
special assessments for streets, uh, street reconstructions, but also uh, sidewalk uh, improvements, which are probably the most, um, from staff's experience, the one that generates the most calls, the most uh, administrative overhead, in addition to the streets. Uh, and as it was pointed out multiple times, is that this does not apply to utility special assessments. Those are different. A large part, uh, utilities, water is regulated by the Public Service Commission, but there would still be those assessments. But the recognition is that for larger properties, um, a significant portion of the assessment would go away. For smaller properties, it's probably closer to half. Um, it wouldn't completely eliminate them because utility assessments, one lateral per lot, pretty much is about the same distance to the edge of the street. So you'd still be paying for uh, utility special assessments, but that's what the other communities that have used these fees as an alternative to special assessments have done. Of course, uh, there are different equity issues in terms of how you apply the maximum because there's a couple little uh, nuances with that because you have uh, the maximum is per parcel or is it per land use and depending on the nature of the ownership you could have multiple ownership you could have multiple parcels in a single development or just one and those issues Nina themselves has admitted that they haven't worked out yet they haven't implemented their fee even though their council approved it I think it would be more appropriate from a transparency standpoint that that's laid out before council before you vote on it rather than saying well go figure it out and put it into the rules and don't really talk about it and I, I don't think that reflects uh, the transparency values that the council has so that's um, that's essentially the crux of where the committee's recommendation was we were in no position to prepare ordinances and resolutions because I think those details that I just referenced they need to get worked out um, with that um, Councilmember Mugarauer, I'm not sure if you want to add any other flavor to to the meeting itself and some of the context of the committee. Sure. Uh, first, um, I have to say thank you to Trina and her staff, as well as James Robbie and, and City Manager Roloff. They've been working with us since August when we took it back up, and I know this council and, and previous um, finance committees have, have spoken and discussed it at length numerous times. Um, but we've been working on it since August. Um, and we came to what uh, what we all felt that night it was a unanimous decision uh, to move forward with a suggestion to replace the special assessments for road work and sidewalks with a um, a fee that's applied to your to your water bills similar to the uh, as as city manager roll up mentioned similar to the stormwater um, utility um, some of the things that that led us there were one um, that committee listened when we met in November. Um, it was right, I think it was right after a budget meeting. They, they listened to um, the concerns about equity and um, uh, definitely listened to staff's um, thoughts as to um, how to save time, how to save labor, um, with, uh, especially with adding in the, the sidewalk um, potential uh, to cover that in there. Uh, the amount of time and, and effort it takes to administer that program every year, um, it adds up. And, and for what we looked at, um, we could do that. We could cover that as well. Um, the equity part of it, everybody would be paying and everybody would be receiving a benefit. That was a, a huge driving concern. Um, previously under the wheel tax, as it's been pointed out uh, numerous times, uh, and rightfully so, um, only the people driving cars 8,000 pounds and less would be receiving uh, that cost. And yet, uh, depending on what council uh, had chosen, only a small segment of the population could be receiving a benefit. In this case, Everybody pays and everybody receives uh, a benefit. Um, personally, as well, for the finance side of it, uh, paying cash for these construction projects um, is a big plus for me. Instead of having to take up, uh, it's an any given year, anywhere from 1 million to 3.2 million in loans over you know um, 10 to 20 year notes and bonds um, to cover that. With the interest, those things keep compounding. Now we can pay cash every year and, and reduce our borrowing by um, an estimate of potentially $2 million or more per year uh, in borrowing. That's a big thing for me um, as we go forward looking at our, our long-term debt and how we fund, um, how we fund those operations. Um, I think, 
that was it for the beginning of it. I definitely want to be able to answer any of the council members' questions from my side of it that I can, but maybe I'll take it back up afterwards. The one thing I want to say, and I'll make this very clear, uh, Trina and I met this afternoon and went through a spreadsheet for the street of mine that was done two years ago, Bayshore Drive. And there's two sides of Bayshore Drive. One has more rental than the other, uh, has uh, homes with a much bigger frontage on the, on the street. And so everyone understands, no matter what we call this, you will still wind up paying for some other work. You will still be paying for your, your laterals and so forth. And we looked at both sides of the street. This is work done two years ago. The north side, which is almost all single family, uh, at the end of the day, the homeowner would be paying still 25% of the work. And this would, the other 75 is covered by this fee. We looked at the other side of the street, which has a different mixture of properties, and surprisingly, the numbers shifted by 1%. So in that case, uh, the homeowner is picking up, the property owner is picking up 24%. The other 76 is covered by this fee. So I think there's a lot of mis misconceptions in the community that this will make these fees assessments go away. It will not. There is still basically a 25% cost to the property owner at the end of the day. So everyone just keep that in mind. This uh, We can't emphasize that enough that there will still be a remaining cost to the property owner. Miss uh, Councilmember Allison Osby. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that was actually one of my points because that was the question that I was going to ask back to uh, Mr. <coughs> McGrower and Mr. Roloff is, you know, that it's it's not that it covers 100% of sidewalks and um, impervious surfacing, right? The bill would be based on impervious surface, but there would be a flat rate of uh, roughly uh, less than $4 a month for a resident. No, property. but what I'm saying when it comes to, like, sidewalks happen to be replaced it's not covering a hundred percent or you're saying it is covering this, this will cover, is 100%. This will cover 100 percent aprons that are required to be done because we have an apron driveway apron policy as well but pardon me if i if i'm Please interrupting keep, but keep going 100 for sidewalk replacement 100 percent for apron uh replacement uh, right from the streets department whatever they okay. determine needs to be replaced uh, that would be included in our suggestion from the committee level to council okay and it's the underground work Right. Correct. That Ladder, water lines, sewer. And that's so, that's what I'd say. So, like, to um, the point that was just made, and, and probably Mayor Cummings knows this, maybe even Deputy Mayor Paul Mary, I know Mr. Peck. I obviously, you know, whenever you're, you're looking to run for your seat on council and you have the opportunity to communicate with the public and getting signatures, um, outside of everybody wanting a KFC still, the, the second thing that was incredibly important um, was definitely understanding what this exactly meant. And I think we have to be just really, really careful because even here, you know, on item number 42, recommendation from Long, Long Range Finance Committee regarding funding options to replace street and sidewalk special assessments. So if you're not in the know, you're gonna read that and you're going to think this is gonna cover everything. And I can tell you that is the perception. Um, especially being out um, and, and talking to our citizens, um, you know, just prior to the first week of January. So I think um, I really appreciate the work that Long Range Finance is doing and, and staff is doing because, again, we've talked about this, gosh, I think it's come around once every other year, every two yeah. years or so. Um, but I think however we, whatever we do and if we move forward with this and we do think it's a good idea to do it, I think we just have to be very, very careful. And I think we also need to work with our partners in the community um, like Oshkosh Independent and also the Oshkosh Herald just to make sure that we have the wording correct so that the public is not misled. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Thank you, Mayor. I would agree with uh, Councilwoman Allison Asby, um, as far as getting that word out. Um, and I think we also need to thank the city of Nina for coming up with a creative alternative that we could borrow and, and make our own that would apply, uh, potentially be more palatable. 
Um, I do have a question uh, for Mr. Roloff, Mr. Mugrauer, as it relates to there were some suggestions and discussions about whether or not there would be, for lack of a better word, an amnesty or some kind of <clears throat> prorated forgiveness, I guess, for those who have recently and however recently gets defined um, uh, had to pay that fee. And I guess I would just ask if you could share any more detail on that. That was discussed by the committee, and I think that they felt that that was something that we would come back and look at. Uh, the city of Nina, has, it's a very modest, uh, very modest uh, approach to it. Essentially, they would waive the fee for up to five years, uh, depending on how recent your special assessments were. The more most recent would be a five-year uh, waiver of the fee, down to if it was five years ago or five uh, construction years ago would be a one year. So that would vary. So the look back equals the forgiveness or the amnesty or whatever. Yeah, okay. but the issue is that the dollar wise, uh, the maximum would be roughly about less than $250. So if you had a $10,000 assessment, the, it really is a drop in the bucket. But I think it was, it was meant to be- Good faith. Good faith, yeah. And, and I think that was the issue. Matt, I'm not sure what you. I can that, that you you put it very well, but that was the thing. It was um, that committee felt that maybe that was more um, council direction. The council needed to, to make that that uh, determination. And if so, could always go back to Long Range Finance for for you know their further consideration. But that that being a policy decision, um, helping out taxpayers um, retroactively may be more of a council directive than uh, coming from them telling you to to give amnesty or an exemption. Um, after the fact. But Mr. Roloff's right, um, the amount, while it does every dollar is important, and I've always said that, um, in the comparison to what some of the special assessments have been over the last few years, it only adds up to a couple hundred dollars, um, but definitely worthwhile discussing and as a uh, olive branch uh, to those that uh, <coughs> get pretty hard by some of the special assessment costs that maybe that is something that's, that has to be an option. And I think as we give direction, uh, hopefully it's positive direction because I'm <clears throat> supportive of it, but uh, as we give direction that maybe that is one of the things that, that staff prepares, you know, if there was a five back, uh, maybe a five year look back or a five year or a three year or whatever year, um, that, uh, that staff puts those numbers together to show us what that would mean in terms of bottom line as to how much revenue would still be generated even with those exemptions. Yeah. Keep we in mind, we only, especially a sense, 100-ish properties every year for road work, a couple hundred. It's not, I mean. James just nodded yes. Yeah, so yeah, you're in the 100 to, 100 to 150 property <clears throat> range per year for, I mean, think Oregon and Washington and, and the few other streets we just did around this area. So it doesn't amount to a whole lot, so it definitely is, is worthwhile talking about as part of the process. One last thing I wanted to, to put in there was, um, actually two, uh, the committee definitely felt the need to uh, educate and educate very well. That was something that they definitely um, spoke several times about uh, and do it well and do it often and uh, do it again, uh, just to make sure people fully understood what they were getting and, and what they weren't. And then the other part was, um, another positive was this was, this is local control on this issue. If we instituted some sort of wheel tax or a vehicle registration fee, it's administered by the state and it's cut and dry what we get to do with it when we institute it and what they return to us. In this particular case, we get 100% of the funds and we get to decide what happens and how it happens with those funds because it's local control on this issue with, with this particular fee structure. Councilmember Herman. Thank you, Mayor. And I guess that was my question and Mr. McGraw sort of answered it. The wheel tax or vehicle registration fee, whatever you want to call it, was controlled by state statute. There is no oversight on this? other than us oversighting it? At this time, I think it's viewed, and I think City Attorney Lawrence spoke with the City Attorney and Nina, and yeah, they both looked at it, and it's, it's under home rule, uh, so we have home rule. Now, that doesn't mean that, that a state legislature could uh, say no to that at some time in the future, and there's no way I, anybody can guarantee that. Uh, remember a couple years ago when we were at the League Conference, we went back to talking about the vehicle registration fee because the concern was that the state legislature was going to either restrict it or eliminate it or something like that. Um, and it didn't come to pass, but it got, it got 
traction for a while. I can't tell you that somebody would say, well, first Nina did it, now Oshkosh is doing it. We need to stop this. And the danger with anything changing your special assessment policy is going back. Because then if you think people are mad about a look back provision, if you suspend it for one year and you don't special assess and then you go back to the old way, there are going to be a lot of people angry, except the people that you gave a waiver to. <clears throat> Other than that, everybody else in town will be pretty angry, and I and I have specific experience with that. That once you go, once you change your policy, you got to stick to it. Hopefully, the state wouldn't pull the rug out from under us, but I can't guarantee okay. that. That being said, though, and and I agree <laughs> with what you're saying. I think we as a council need to be very very specific to what that money is going to be used for because all of a sudden we're short someplace else oh we got this extra money it was supposed to be for sidewalks or it's supposed to pay for the concrete but we really got a bigger problem over here and we want to shift that money I think we need to make sure that in any ordinance and I support moving forward with this but that we are very specific to what that money can be used for and only future councils or when, when I'm long gone can make a decision to change that. Otherwise, I think it, the perception out in the community is going to be it's just another way of putting money in our coffers to do whatever we want to do with the money. And I think that is a could be a bad perception out in the community. So I think we have to be, to, to Mr. McGrower's point, concrete sidewalks period and it's very specific in the ordinance that that's what that can be used for can't be used for anything else without council approval well my only one fear is once Madison gets whiffed it gets a smell that we're collecting money that they're not getting a piece of the action what might they do to start to get some of that money into their coffers are we I safe? Think, I think you're giving yourselves a perfect topic to talk to our legislators about when we meet with them on February 25th. I think we got to talk about that because having the rug pulled out from under us would be devastating. Uh, and I'm sure Nina would feel similarly. We're going to have representatives from both sides of the aisle at that meeting. I think we can, you know, look, this is what we're trying to do. And um, I think they're sympathetic. They understand the, how special assessments are an issue. And everybody knows that you've been wrestling with this issue for a good part of five, six years. I think the only, thought, the only concern is as more and more communities go in this direction, which I assume they will, will Madison really um, want to put their hands in our pocket? Good topic to bring up with the lead. All right. Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Okay, just a real quick question, I guess, for um, Ms. Larson. <coughs> then. Uh, would, do you foresee any, um, I guess, impact on expenditure restraint with this particular method? I would not see with the expenditure restraint. I would see they take the <coughs> avenue of levy limits. Um, that's what they've done with revenue is they've imposed restrictions on two levy, levy limits. Meaning that if the, some of these cases they've said if you increase, you create a fee uh, that you have to lower your all right. Uh, levy limit that's by right. that dollar amount. Again, it, it's a fear that's out there. Um, we have already discussed if this was adopted, how we would enable ourselves. We keep keep a separate fund, in part to, to discuss what Councilmember Herman talked about is making sure it's in more of a lockbox for yeah. specific purposes, but also so that we stay out of expenditure restraint and um, any possible levy limit impact. points mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> essentially mr. mayor what staff will do at this time is we'll work on appropriate ordinances and resolutions <clears throat> and policy options because there'll be policy options and yeah you know, we'll report to council when we think we can get it going just so you know we will proceed with special assessment hearings because as you mentioned mr. mayor the utility assessments are still applicable we'll notify people of the street assessment but we're going to disclose to them this is going on and I, I suspect that your special assessment hearing will 
um, you'll find a lot of supporters of this idea when you show them a, a eight to ten thousand dollar assessment and I think we're going to put a disclaimer uh, sort of a, a bright colored item in there saying this reflects uh, including streets councils considering uh, possible amendments you know will it'll be adjusted accordingly something to let them know what's going on and make it stand out so uh, it's separate but understandable within the context of them getting a notice about a special assessment and, and I think I we've just... got to put together a plan for communicating to the citizens that they will in fact still be paying a portion of this assessment and it's well I think if it's very specific that it covers the concrete in their street in their sidewalk but they are still responsible for the water lateral the storm sewer and the sanitary sewers that is still going to be accessible that should I be think people see street and they don't think visuals. underneath well I, I, I agree I but it's oh, just yeah. like when they send My it sidewalk. all when we do a street they they show all the laterals all the information and I think we what you don't pay for what you pay for yeah it's it's going to involve a lot of education yes. and that's, that's what, what I'm saying do we this education. like that we have to right. really educate right Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Just one other request, um, Ms. Roloff. If when that comes back to us with those different policy options and um, more fleshed out, could we have that in a more formal policy analysis format? Could you Absolutely. indulge us? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to citizen statements of the council. Has anyone registered? No one is registered. And I will not wreath this whole thing. Now we have council member announcements and statements. Usually this time of year we do a recap on the fire department's food and toy drive from from December. And uh, but rather than he, me go through it, we would have one of the organizers uh, come forward and explain what they did this past December. So we have Eric Shea here, and I see him coming up. So uh, the floor is all yours. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. As uh, the mayor said, I'm Eric Shea. I'm a firefighter paramedic with the Oshkosh Fire Department. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs of our uh, food and toy drive that we do every year. Um, this year was our 20th year, um, 20th annual drive. Um, <clears throat> so this year we um, we had a record year in um, food and or in toy and money donations. Um, I guess I should step back. Do you guys, do you want me to explain a little bit what the drive is about or? Um... I wish you would for the public because okay, you know, sure. we've all done the drive with you yeah. through all the years, but the public, you know, they hear the fire truck <laughs> going down the street and they may not know exactly what is going on. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, this was our 20th year. We get um, off-duty members from the fire department and their families to walk door to door with us to collect food, toys, and cash donations for the, um, <coughs> For the Salvation Army, the Salvation Army then um, distributes those through their distribution center and through their Adopt a Family program. Um, so we also have the uh, Oshkosh Fire and Police Equipment Store come with us to. Uh, they provide the antique fire tr truck that Santa rides on. That's kind of his sleigh. So we uh, go through the cities. We sound the fire engine, make a lot of noise, play Christmas music, and we just go to door and collect uh, food and toys for the Salvation Army. So um, as I mentioned, this year we had a record year in uh, toy and money donations. Um, overall, we took in 3,589 pounds of food, uh, 3,590 physical toys, and $3,518.80 in cash donations. Um, so as you can see, the numbers up there are, we break it down per station, per route. Um, so those are the numbers from this year. And then I, I added up. Since uh, my coworker and I took it over in 2010, we've uh, kept track of every night, and uh, we have taken in since 2010 over 40,000 pounds of food, 26,000 toys, and nearly $20,000. So um, that's pretty impressive. From you know the citizens of Oshkosh, we can't thank everyone enough for all the work they do and all their generosity. Um, so as I mentioned, I'd like to just. Give a shout out to the Salvation Army and um, Captain uh, Don Carl and his wife Vicki, who do a lot of the behind the scenes work for this. Um, they provide a truck every night with us that we uh, put all the donations in and then they distribute them through their program that they have set up. And then um, 
And they also handle the applications for the families in need and stuff like that. So they're instrumental to working with us and getting the donations where they need to go. Um, Darren Moxon at the Oshkosh Fire and Police Equipment Store, he helps with the uh, antique fire engine and gets it going, gets the music and the lights working and everything we need for that. And then also uh, Rick Lieb and um, Kim Gauthier from the Oshkosh uh, North Communities Program. Their staff and students um, help us with a lot of behind the scenes work of promoting the drive. Um, some of you may have seen this year the yard signs that we had out. That was all the students there. That was all their idea to create those and get the word out that way. And then they help with a lot of the social media <coughs> aspect of it, of uh, promoting it on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I'd also like to mention we have a Facebook and Twitter page where we send out the routes and um, some of the information every night and try to post videos and photos of, of the nights. So. <coughs> well, you guys do a great job. It's, Thank you. It's been fun to participate too. Yeah, yeah, and we appreciate you all coming along whenever you can, and it's great. Um, you know, from my aspect, it's great just to get out to the city that we serve and go door to door and, you know, have a short conversation with people and, you know, see the generosity of everyone here, so. It was a pleasure to participate. <clears throat> Yeah. Some of us walked the entire route. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they get to be a little long sometimes, but yeah. Great job. All right. Thank Thanks. you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Eric. <clears throat> Mr. Roloff, uh, <clears throat> I will turn, the, <clears throat> excuse me, turn this over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And statements. Handful of things here. Uh, there's a memo in your packet regarding uh, purchase of portable radios for the fire department. Uh, we uh, are part of a uh, uh, state uh, D Wisconsin Department of Administration purchase contract so uh, happy to get those those are uh, items that are in the budget um, the, uh, the second one has to do with a uh, project that we're working on with the council uh, city clerk Uberg had placed a uh, item in the newsletter this past week uh, it pretty much runs the same thing it's about a policy for unused liquor licenses um, really just strengthening that language to give the council uh, authority that they've been enacting, but it's not specified out there that you can grant extensions based on your judgment. We're gonna be uh, proposing that for you to consider. Um, and then also giving the clerk the authority to withhold issuance of licenses until all the conditions are met. So it's very clear that the city clerk has those uh, responsibilities. If a health <laughs> inspection doesn't pass, if, if one of those other inspections don't pass, gives her that, that authority to do so. Um, the idea is that uh, City Clerk Ubrig sends out the uh, materials around March for or March 15th. We'd like to get it adopted by the council by March 1st. So I think you'll see the first draft of the ordinance, so the first reading of the ordinance at the meeting in February, adoption at the second meeting in February, and that'll enable uh, City Clerk to put those in there. So everybody will be forewarned when they receive their renewal materials. And we figured that was probably the, the most effective way to do it. Um, Update on possible redevelopment of Aviation Plaza. You'll recall back in December uh, that uh, I reported I was approached by uh, some of the owners of property there about a possible development, um, and they said they were wanted to come to a subsequent meeting. It didn't happen on January 8th, and it's not happening again on January 22nd. Uh, they're not at this time prepared to make that presentation. They're still working on issues. Some of the concerns you still you expressed back then are still valid. Uh, they're aware of those things and I don't have an exact date at this time but I'll keep you posted just so you know but I know there was some curiosity about that because it was supposed to be imminent and now it hasn't been so um, my advice to council is don't hold your breath so it's just one of those things um, report of vendors receiving over three hundred thousand uh, dollars in payments from the city in 2018 um, finance director Larson had uh, put the memo in your packet this evening that normally accompanies that but this is a report that that we're required to do uh, according to code and uh, I think it just gives you the reading of all the vendors who we do most of the largest numbers are for uh, capital improvement projects um, and other deposits related to investments and uh, uh, processing of payments big big dollar amounts and then there's also the ones that are uh, that I think council is also concerned about our uh, engineering and professional services. Those are all in there. Um, and if you have any questions about those, uh, I think uh, I'd encourage you to contact Finance Director Larson. Um, but 
several years ago, uh, the council uh, and, and finance director Larson and I felt strongly about this. I had the authority to grant unlimited contract approval for professional services. I didn't think that was appropriate. Um, and so we enacted an ordinance that uh, council has to approve anything over 75,000 um, or if it changes that it gets it over 75,000 and then also report anything over 25,000. I think that's worked very well. Um, I think it holds staff accountable and I want that accountability. That's, uh, I was not comfortable in issuing contracts uh, of an unlimited amount and so finance director Larson and her staff with this report that's now required by code we provide it annually. Um, I'm really impressed that um, uh, Trina was able to get this report out within three weeks after the start of the year. So kudos to, to Trina and her staff for, for getting that done. Um, we can answer questions, but if you got a question about an individual one, I'd probably suggest that you talk to Ms. Larson uh, uh, separately about those. I was just going to. Mm commend her for um, putting that together in like you said such a short amount of time of having uh, implemented that new system that's that's the kind of thing I think we've been asking to see for for a while now so it's kind of nice to finally see that come to fruition uh, the next one is also according to our uh, one of our policies our donation report um, we're a little late on this one. I guess we, we discovered that this one was also requiring an annual report. So uh, we have the donation report for 2015, 16, and 17. Um, the council does approve some of these, and I approve others. Uh, but this is just a report of anything over $100 or more. We get a lot of small ones that we, we, we just, for purposes of this report, we don't include. I just had one question about the format on that, and that is um, it looks like the the second part of the document gives us who the donor was, but the majority of the first part of the document, we can't see who the donor was. Can you help me understand that? Sure. Uh, as part of the donation policy, we changed some of the procedures, which one of the forms was a donation form. So after the implementation of that donation form, that allowed us to gather greater detail, which is that you're seeing that impact in this report now. So the years prior to that is where more limited data was available, and we didn't have the necessary forms to give you the detail. All right, I can ask you my other questions some other time. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Oshkosh Corporation uh, headquarters uh, update is in your agenda packet. Happy to answer any questions if you have there. Um, <coughs> Deputy Mayor Palmieri and I discussed, and, and I think I've, I've heard from several of you about, you know, the local impact of federal government shutdown. Um, you know, I think we provided you with the internal perspective on the city of Oshkosh operational side, and right now there really isn't much of an impact. We don't get much fe direct federal dollars. Uh, the one program that we get the most direct federal dollars is the Community Development Block Grant Program, CDBG. Uh, but there is also a federal requirement that we must spend the prior year's allocation before we can get the New Year's allocation. And we're in a position where we haven't spent that money yet. So we're still in the mode of spending that. Um, if we were in a position where we were asking uh, for reimbursement of federal funds, um, right now they wouldn't be processed. Um, fortunately with our you know with our fund balance and our uh, cash reserves we have cash flow from a cash flow standpoint we have sufficient funds to do that um, for, so from the city standpoint we're okay right now the only other one that that probably would draw the most concern if it dragged out much longer would be on the transit side all of our funds come from the state but the state gets a lot of their funds from the federal government Roughly 50-50, not exactly, but close enough. Um, and if the state stopped receiving funds, they would probably cash flow it for a while. But at a certain point, they would hit hit the wall and say, "Sorry, cities, we can't distribute funds because we don't have enough sufficient funds." Uh, I could see that scenario happening. We haven't gotten any indication from the state that they've hit that wall yet. Um, so on the city side, the city operational side, it's not significant. However, the impact on the community, it depends on who you talk to. Um, the county, because in Wisconsin, counties have 
primary responsibility for much of the, the welfare programs, traditional welfare programs, they're going to get hit more uh, quickly with that. Uh, they've gotten notices that uh, the, the food stamp program will be cutting short. Now, does that impact directly our operations, our finances? No. Uh, but think back to when the Great Recession occurred. The impact on the food pantry was significant because donations uh, went down and need went up. And that is a distinct possibility as things go on. Um, with that, I know Councilmember Palmieri has, has sent me numerous things. There's this and there's that. There are so many other moving parts that don't have to do with the city, but certainly are going to have an impact on our community uh, as the uh, shutdown drags on. Just one very quick comment. Uh, uh, I find it inconceivable that our elected officials, better known as senators and congressmen in Washington who are getting paid, would stiff government employees. And I can't think of a better term. They can call it what they want. It's they're stiffing employees. And if you did that in the private sector, the employees would walk. And the chairman, the president of the company would be fired within nanoseconds of stiffing the employees. I, I just can't uh, comprehend how they sit there and, 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 and are stifling the country's economy and, and, and again, I'll say it again, stifling and stiffing employees. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor Palmieri. Yeah, just a follow-up comment. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Olaf, I'm wondering, um, you know, would it be appropriate for us to have some type of joint discussion or you to reach out perhaps to some of our county folks as to, you know, some of those scenarios um, because it also applies to a significant number of folks that are in housing. I believe um, the director for the housing authority mentioned, you know, there were over 413 properties um, involved as well. And, and I guess I would just encourage folks that are receiving those county benefits to reach out to your county caseworker or um, someone to verify, you know, what your, what your benefits are um, in this coming month. I'm not really sure I, in terms of what we can do in sort of notifying people. You know, we do have the ability through um, our various communications channels to let the public know about some of these things. Is that what you're talking about? Just trying to let them know that, you know, make sure you check in with your uh, appropriate agency. Uh, we can certainly do that through our um, through our communications channels. But that's about it. That's, you know, we can't, uh, you know, we're going to be concerned about what happens at the food pantry. and. If it's any concern there, we're going to talk to them, uh, but we can't directly directly help them. But we can certainly let people know. We should here. probably be prepared to know what what they're able to handle. Yeah, we can certainly do that. And uh, just so we end on a more up note, <laughs> I'm glad I did, I put the last one last. Uh, the uh, mascots and movies event uh, at the senior center. Uh, is this Friday yep. and it will also be on February 23rd uh, fun event free admission donations appreciated uh, lots of different mascots the A&W bear and all those things that you see on the screen so we certainly want to encourage people family oriented event bring your PJs blankets whatever uh, enjoy yourselves and we're going to be promoting it through uh, our social media so wanted to uh, make council aware of that and with that that's all I have Mr. Mayor all right, thank you. I just want to, before we adjourn, want to make a real quick comment. <coughs> I want to thank some people for the other evening. Uh, my, my good friend and co-chair for Unity and Community, Dr. Sylvia Carey Butler, who was the Vice Chancellor of Academic Support and Inclusiveness at the uh, University, Chancellor Levitt. They, um, I was honored with the 2019 Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Community Service Award. That's it. Thanks for being here which I'll keep away from my grandson. There you go. Uh, it was a total surprise. As a matter of fact, you guys kept a good secret. Mark knew, the chief of police knew, Diane knew. I had no clue what was going on. As a matter of fact, I had to leave the session early to get back here to meet with a bunch of Cub Scouts. And you called me and said, you've got to get back here because Dean had to talk to me about something. So I kind of panicked. What is he going to talk to me about? And 
We had to come up with a lie and come up with a quick. So, <laughs> you guys kept the secret very well. So thank you, everyone. It was it was a heck of an honor. So uh, with that, I will look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.